I'm like a wannabe planner. I'm a wannabe emergency manager. I'm like a wannabe flood expert. I'm a wannabe a lot of things. Um, and uh, Lori, Lori Johnson has um, advised me throughout my career. I knew her long before I even started back in graduate school and um, basically came to her and said, I want to save the world. And um, she, of course, advised me correctly and go get your PhD. And, and I did that. I did that for a very, very long time. But um, along the way, um, anyway, there, there were many moments uh, that I that structural engineering felt too narrow to me that I wanted to drop out and get a PhD in policy or get a PhD in planning and get a PhD and, and something else. And, um, you know, stayed to it because at the end of the day, that's what I am. I am an engineer and um, I think of things in that regard. And um, what I wanted to share with you today, and I, I, I hate to kind of disjoint two different presentations, but I am gonna talk about two different things today and just kind of really explain to you sort of the vision that I have and building resilience, building community resilience across disasters, not just earthquakes or not just hurricane. Um, and, and I think that there's a lot um, that we can do in that, that entire space. And then just kind of give you guys some updates on where the structural engineering community is um, advancing and trying to promote and, and um, actually really codify um, a building code geared towards resilience. So the first thing um, I am, and, and I, I'm like, I'm first off tickled that we have a fellow structural engineer, a fellow Cal Poly Mustang, because that's that was my my heart and soul, um, and a, a fellow um, just uh, people who love um, focusing on these issues um, uh, in, I wouldn't say in developing countries, but, but um, really across the entire board. Um, what brought me, I'm a structural engineer, earthquake engineer by training, and um, it all started, you know, I, I was on my track. I even went back to graduate school. I, I had been a consulting designer for, for a while in Berkeley and um, wanted to do more. I went to an EERI conference and um, was really just my, my fire was lit to do more. And um, I went back to, to, to graduate school and started focusing on confined, well, uh, eventually, ultimately on confined masonry just common throughout Latin America in Puerto Rico. Um, so I was really focusing, this is a, a picture from Haiti in particular. This actually picture right here um, is what inspired um, kind of the rest of my career, I think, um, even though it's so specific to earthquake engineering. What you're looking at is confined masonry. Uh, confined masonry performs really well relative to masonry infilled frames, um, but seeing that, making that distinguished distinguishing characters and finding that um, is hard to do. And um, kind of shortly after this, I was tasked with trying to um, kind of help quantify the performance of confined masonry and masonry buildings in developing countries for the USGS pager effort. And what they were trying to do is um, improve, um, pager basically can send out alerts, they monitor earthquakes all over the, the world, of course, and um, they were trying to make their models more, improve their models, uh, to better capture real world conditions. And they were sort of over overlooking confined masonry and the, and the, the great performance that it does. And I thought that was, um, uh, to be polite or ignorant, um, it does perform so much better than, than masonry and filled frames. And I it just sort of set me on this track of trying to identify and distinguish individual building characteristics that we can then plug into all these catastrophe models. Um, I just, I wanted to do a better job of what we can do and then take that information, feed it to decision makers, feed it to planners, feed it to, to other folks um, who actually need that information to, to make, to make the, the better choices or, or um, actually make improvements. Um, if you'll see, I also claim to be a recovering academic. Um, uh, I know enough about remote sensing and AI to get myself in trouble. And then I call on my my employees to help me out and <laughs> bail me out, I think. But I uh, just want to reiterate, I've always wanted to, to kind of contribute to the, to the broader picture. And um, Rob, I, I'm glad that actually you said that, that I, um, uh, I don't know, do other things, I suppose, because uh, Lori, I had a conversation with her once and I, I was sort of struggling with my, for me, my, my business and what do I want to do? And I don't know, what do I, I kind of want to do it all. And she said, you're an earthquake engineer. And I was like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure that I am anymore. I feel like it. And, and then this whole space, and I really like this, this graphic because it's kind of specific, but 
in our response to risk, in our, you know, attempt at, at creating resilient communities, you know, my little piece is supposed to be this, this building component. And by God, like we're going to, I'm going to engineer the hell out of that one part because what I know in my experiences in emergency management, in my like wannabe desire to be a planner um, in insurance, like I've, I've avoided insurance and policy my entire career. And it turns out those are the two things that we need um, to actually recover and, um, and, and create these resilient communities. But um, I know that this is my lane um, and, and we're going to do a great job of it. But I think that there's so much in, in all of these components that technology can really aid and facilitate and we can all improve, improve this process together. So um, what I uh, try to do in my career, I guess it, it, where I've landed now is just is trying to bridge the gap between um, what we know about the built environment, um, what we know about hazards that occur in those in in the in in, uh, in the environment um, and risk associated with that, with the actual needs of emergency managers and planners and decision makers. For me, what it comes down to is: is my work impacting what's happening on the ground? And I don't know that I can say that it has yet. It matters to me very much that something that, that um, uh, just a regular old citizen, a like regular resident in a community can be aware of their hazards, know, you know what repairs or retrofits they might need to make, where they might need to move, um, to be more aware of, of, of our dynamic earth, if you will, and, and the role and the, the vulnerability that they have in it. So in the built environment, I just I'm I'm I want to enumerate things. That's that's sort of my my tagline, I guess. Um, this is just the, the the place that I focus. What can we do better to better understand and communicate the hazards that we have in our community, in our in our in our communities, our society, in the world? How do we better? How can we better quantify, measure? and communicate those risks to the people who actually need the information to make change. Because that's not us as structural engineers. We can only do so much. We improve building codes and we do that, but we're not out front. We're like the last people to, to be noticed. Um, and then in the built environment, how are the buildings being used? How are they made? How well were they made? What sort of uh, you know, hazards can they actually sustain? So just trying to, to put numbers put um, ways behind that, that we can can get that information out. So um, it's basically my, my uh, you know, attempt here is um, using technology applications to capture in situ conditions, not to estimate, but to actually measure, to measure what's going on. And um, I have some experience in remote sensing and machine learning and, um, and image processing. And it's trying to take all these pieces together, use them to measure the real world conditions. So um, we have lots of different techniques using LIDAR, um, measuring building uh, features and characteristics, building geometries. We can easily, you know, in the, in the natural environment, capture trees, even tree types. They can distinguish between tree types using LIDAR um, and count them. You know, these aren't, this isn't uh, unattainable. Using satellite and aerial imagery, we can um, get spectral data. That means like actual spectral signatures and I start identifying materials, um, leaves, um, building uh, roofing materials, which if we know roofing materials that can help us, you know, sort of start to um, uh, guesstimate, if you will, what uh, that building structure type is. Um, and on the artificial intelligence side, um, using image processing techniques and, and AI to start to um, sort of uh, begin to capture and collect building inventories. And that's some of the work that I'm working on now. Whoops. Um, so this is this is some of the work that I'm, I'm going to, this is a lot of what I just kind of mentioned, but sort of some visuals that sort of help you um, capture that. But you know, down here in the bottom left, um, this is data using LIDAR that we can use LIDAR to What's unique about this is to actually aggregate and identify building features by each building, not across a whole area, which is some of the out of the box solutions out there, but to actually um, aggregate that information and assign an address, assign a, a geometric characteristic of a building to an address, and then associate that with any other data that we can. Um, excuse me. Um, and, and just kind of creating and displaying that information in easy to use, facilitating ways for um, for other engineers to go ahead and, and wipe through. So um, we're doing some work. We just wrapped up a pilot program with uh, Degenkolb 
to inventory the city of Torrance. And, you know, AI can't solve every single problem. And I, I'm not going to stand here or sit here and, and advocate that it can. It cannot, because at the end of the day, there's so much on the line. Um, we can't just say this is an unreinforced masonry. That's a soft story and, and flag them with an AI with a computer and not have somebody, you know, with, with an SE you know, license behind them to, uh, to actually validate that. There's, um, you know, it, it's, we get to the point of policy development and things like that where we just can't make these gross um, flags on, on individual buildings. So um, enumerating disasters, uh, post disaster, we have so many tools available. We can identify and we can use LIDAR without pre disaster data. We can actually identify collapsed structures using LIDAR and image processing techniques. Um, we can identify flooded buildings. We can identify miles in depth of flooded roadway, uh, debris volume in roadways. Um, I just, this is, this is like my picture. This is what I see and, and what we can do um, with these different tools. And some of them are, are um, in development. Some of them are you know, emerging out of academia. We're trying to, to bring, to, to kind of bridge that gap between academia in the real world and we're having some success. But I think that the, the, the point that I wanna communicate is that we can get there soon. So I'm just gonna plant this, this question in your heads now. If, if when I'm, I'm walking through these things, what, you know, in, in five years when this is a push of a button, in 10 years when this is like just status quo, what is, how can we start laying the groundwork now that these tools can help us in the planning, mitigation, the response and the recovery phases of disasters. Um, okay, the other piece that I love, and this is probably what Rob knows uh, about uh, kind of specifically, is um, the importance of scientific modeling and sensing and hazards and really capturing real world situations. Um, the bottom line is that we need really good sensor data in order to do good modeling. We need good modeling in order to do good planning and to do good policy development. Um, high quality sensor data are needed for scientific planning and applied hydrology purposes. I'm, I'm speaking specifically about flood right now, but um, there's parallels of course in, in any other hazard. As long as we can measure it, then we, we have to have good data to do it. We have to uh, maintain that equipment. It has to be transmitted, it has to be usable, it has to be scientific quality. Um, without reliable gauges and calibrated data, consistent data transmission networks, and regular maintenance, and that's a key, key piece. We are flying blind towards the future. We, we have to have this on the ground sensor data in order to, um, to model and project and, and imagine what the future is gonna bring. Um, the consequence of, of, of not capturing good data, um, those scientific applications such as hydraulic modeling and forecasting, alerting for emergency managers and stakeholders in the public falls, fails, and informed and long-term land use and resilient planning. Um, so garbage in, garbage out, a holistic approach to resilience planning is needed so that long, so that short-term emergency management response and long-term planning are better aligned. And um, not an area that I expected to get into, but um, it is um, near and dear to my heart. Um, we did some work for Virginia, the state of Virginia, and um, kind of took a, a, a big view, a big, uh, 30,000 foot view of their flood monitoring system. And, um, you know, without, it, it just came down to, to policy, it came down to money, it came down to, um, to people's lives being on the line because they didn't have good quality data. So folks were actually lost when um, the local emergency management um, uh, building, when they can't, when the users can't um, well qualify or well quantify um, the rising rivers and things like that, then they can't send out sheriff's deputies to go block off roads. And that did happen um, in Hurricane Michael and folks were lost as a result of it. Um, so my alternative future, if you can, is that, um, you know, if we can, if we can get good sensor data in the environment um, to measure hydrology, um, uh, water quality, um, saltwater intrusion, there's so many things that those sensors are, can facilitate in the future. Uh, I'm not going to try to to do it all now. Again, I'm going to try to stay in my lane. But we need good sensors. We need good data. And if we have it, then we can. Uh, before, so what I, I try to to lay out here before a disaster, when it's coming, and and in the recovery phase, 
we can pre-identify vulnerable populations, overlay those flood models with, um, with uh, uh, um, like SVI, the social vulnerability index, with census data, with housing data. Uh, we can plan scenarios and training exercises. Even some of the most sophisticated flood models out there right now allow you to put in, um, uh, to model or, or pretend like there's flood defenses. So you can tinker around with that, where to do it, best do that. And down to the, the policy side, it's targeting buyout programs. And that's where we're at right now um, is, is trying to really identify where the best bang for your buck is. Um, when, the, when the actual event comes, when will the rain hit? What neighborhoods will flood? We can use the, you know, the, this information for that. How much will occur and what to do? Um, and then when after, of course, you know, where do you stage response teams, evacuation routes, alerting the public? There's a, there's a, there's lots lots that um, that good data can facilitate. So um, just planting it for for later discussion. I'm going to jump right now into the next section. But what role does technology play in in the vision for Puerto Rico? So again, that five years down the line, that ten years down the line. How can this stuff that seems so so you know out there? It's not that out there, and it's possible. And I think that really one of the great benefits for, for Puerto Rico is that you know we can we can use satellite imagery, for example, and look at past flooding events. We don't have to have the sensors on the ground right now. We need to put them on the ground now because we need better data ten years from now. But right now, we can even use historic satellite information, historic satellite imagery. To map out existing flood uh, plains that you know may not be obvious right away. Um, so there's there's a lot that technology can do. A lot of image processing, remote sensing, AI that is available now. You know, sort of emerging. But um, but how can we? Where how can it best facilitate um, the 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 vision that you guys have for Puerto Rico? Um, and of course, the, the the big one: what challenges exist that impede the application of those of those um, methods? Okay, take a breather for a minute. How am I on time? Um, resilience, let's see. Okay, we're okay. Um, um, so, whew, resilience. Um, I'm gonna sw totally switch gears here. Um, I, so Rob mentioned, um, I am on FEMA's National Advisory Council. I am the only structural engineer. I'm the only engineer. I'm the only earthquake person on there. I'm the only one that has anything to do with the built environment. Um, and is that true? I think that's true. We have a fire guy um, who did was the, doing fire coats and stuff. Um, it is, um, it's exasperating. And um, I, I called up Lori after my first meeting and I was like uh, enraged. Um, it, was, it was November, it was the November after Maria struck. And one of FEMA's leaders um, high up uh, came and, and sat in front of us as, you know, I think communication was probably still down at that point in time and sat back, you know, like this in his chair and said, who would have thought we would need telephone poles in Puerto Rico? And I was like, anybody, anybody with any sort of engineering, anybody who like understands electric you know, electricity, you know, transmission or anybody from the American Society of Civil Engineers or anyone from DOE, like why, why is, I was enraged. Um, and uh, anyway, I, I feel like I'm fighting an uphill battle a little bit. I'm, I'm, we're gonna, I'm setting up something to have FEMA leader, well, um, at our next meeting, at least, I hope FEMA leadership will be there, but to just begin introducing this concept of functional recovery what resilience is. Um, I think at the upper echelons, they are aware of it. Um, there's activities going on around this at that level, but um, I, I think having these concepts really um, reshape the vision that we have for our nation, especially on the heels of Biden's infrastructure um, or the 1 billion that he added to FEMA's BRIC program, HMGP, uh, the infrastructure bill, I think that this concept, these concepts of actually what resilience is, actually what functional recovery is, um, isn't, isn't makes it, make, it's, the lexicon isn't really rising up yet. And um, anyway, I hope, I hope, like I said, at the end of the day, at the end of my career, that something happened um, with, with my efforts, but um, 
Um, in addition to FEMA Advisory Council, though, I, I co-chair EERI's um, California Legislative Subcommittee and um, CEOC, structural, uh, the Structural Engineers Association of California, I co-chair their Resilience Committee. So we've been on both fronts and different hats that I wear, kind of been on the front lines of, um, of this effort to push forward a resilient building code, if you will, and a functional recovery building code, if you will and actually really um, working on def defining and, and helping to convince our structural engineer, our structural engineering community of what, um, what resilience is, because we have a long way to go there as well. Oops. Um, I'm gonna read this slide. I, I apologize for reading now, but I think it's important that within our lane of structural engineering, I do wanna make that big banner across that, that qualification. We're approaching this as structural engineers, as earthquake people. So resilience is an attribute of the community, not of buildings. Community resilience is the ability of groups, of our community, our society, what really functions, schools, households, businesses, to recover their functionality in a timely fashion following a disruptive event, and for the buildings that those groups reside in to recover functionality. Um, this concept is affected by the strength and adaptability of social, institutional, and economic networks. Um, but we're, we are focused on the physical aspect of this. Uh, Pre-disaster mitigation measures, physical strengthening, and emergency response capacity. So I, I like this slide. This is a challenge. Resilience is not sustainability. It's not green. It's not lead. It's not environmental justice. And it's not necessarily equitable. But communities should be, and I, we struggle with this, but communities should be all of these things to meet the needs of future generations. It's not to say that resilience is gonna solve every problem, it's not. But within our lane of engineering in that world of the built environment, understanding our hazards, um, resilience is something physical, or well, is, is um, an attribute of the physical environment. Um, lessons from, and I don't know, forgive me if, if all of this is um, a lot of repeat for folks. I'm sure every time that you talk, an, in, an earthquake engineer gives a talk, they, they pull out these slides of Joe's bar. Um, I, during my days of Cal Poly, I remember fondly and thought it was pretty funny. The graphics haven't changed <laughs> in all that time, gosh, 25 years ago, I don't know. So lessons from uh, the performance-based earthquake engineering world. Um, we have learned, uh, this is, yeah, yeah 20, gosh, is that right? At least 25 years ago, you know, this concept was new to me that, um, you know, Joe's bar plus, you know, so what building you have, what ground motion, what hazard happens, and then your building should fall, the performance of the building should fall within one of these categories. It could be fully operational. It could be immediately occupiable. You, life safety, meaning nobody dies or collapse prevention. You crawl out and you don't crawl back in. But we explain all these terms in very odd, awful ways that earthquake hazard levels are difficult to explain. 500 and 2,500 years, um, stakeholders did not understand the consequences of performance objectives. Our stakeholders are architects and building owners, and we rarely get a seat at the table with the building owner. Um, so we just never communicated that well, this, this idea of how we were actually designing the buildings to fall within one of these four categories, we never did well. We don't like talking to people, we're engineers. Um, these discrete performance levels did not translate well into financial decision-making. Um, you know, if you spend 1% more and you'll get a better building, um, it, it, how better, you know, the, the owner wants to know where their money is going. Um, and just an example i like to highlight from, from Christchurch, um, in September 2010, we had a design level earthquake, which is what the buildings were designed for. Um, a few months later, we had a, a maximum credible earthquake. 70% of the buildings were destroyed, including 50% of newer buildings. So that, that piece of communication of, of, of us relaying performance objectives, structural engineers say, yeah, we did a good job, you know, like, that, that's great. That's what those buildings were designed for. Everyone else is like, you're crazy. Yeah, it's terrible. So, um, so this idea of um, functional recovery and reshaping the conversation from um, seismic, from a building, excuse me, from our performance-based earthquake engineering objectives here 
to uh, functional recovery performance objectives. Shifting that conversation from you know, you're falling into one of these four categories to how long will it take until I can do my thing again? How long will it take until my kid can go to school again? How long will it take before gas is turned on in my restaurant so I can open business again? Um, so it's just shifting that conversation. Um, there's been a long history uh, of, of this kind of in development, even beginning with Arabs and their ready rating system, FEMA's P58 method, um, and, and up into, uh, into some more recent work. Um, and actually, one of the ones that I would point to that is excellent is the white paper, um, this is back one back here, uh, that David Bonowitz wrote for EERI. Um, and the CRPG with NIST, um, they're, they're of course doing some excellent work there. But the idea is that we go from those four categories that are very discrete into um, uh, these, these more of a timeline. Um, can we reoccupy, uh, reoccupancy, functional recovery, and full recovery? Uh, reoccupancy, the building uh, is just shelter. Uh, the utilities probably don't work. Functional recovery is it's operational for its primary function, but repairs are needed. Um, the function varies depending on the building. And for full recovery, um, the building is returned to its, to its pre-event status. The social functions, oops, highlighting here, there we go. The social functions of a community define the functional requirements of a community's buildings and infrastructure systems. So to restore a building sufficiently enough and within a reasonable time frame to regain those essential functions that support community resilience. So all of these things on the right-hand side, um, energy, transportation, communication, water, wastewater, and buildings, the actual building itself, support all of these community um, functions um, from healthcare, education, everything. So um, that's what, uh, what we're working towards here. So um, the goal of, of this concept is to not prevent the loss of functionality of all buildings. Our goal is to minimize disruption and restore functions within a reasonable time frame. Some loss of functions can be tolerated. So can you open your restaurant without gas? Probably not. Can you open it without power? Uh, probably not. Can you open it without, uh, actually, just a lot of things for maybe a restaurant's a bad example, but um, you know, your home or a school, there's some functions that we can do without. Um, let's see. I think I hit on this. This um, chart over here is from the NIST CRPG and just talks about di different building clusters and, and starts to break down. We're, the, we're to the point in this process of, of we need to list out the, the structure types and the occupancies that they do and start to try to offer guidelines of um, how long is acceptable or, or should be acceptable um, how long it should take for those buildings to be operational. So the first bunch, you probably can't see it, critical facilities, those should be up and running very quickly. So this is broken out phase one short term in a matter of days. Phase two is intermediate in a matter of weeks and phase term is long, long term. So there's uh, attempts or guidelines um, to try to sort of steer different functions, different building types um, based on their function into, into different categories. Um, and just to put a, an exclamation point at the end of that, um, we did uh, put together this together for SEOC, but um, bottom line is that you want what used to be sort of green tag buildings, you want them to be repaired in a matter of days. And you want yellow tag buildings, they may, I'm sorry, they, they may take, um, you know, in a matter of almost a year um, to actually uh, get back to function. And um, if you see down here, we've sort of tried to, break it down, the best case scenario is to reoccupy functional and full recovery and try to just sort of break that down. So we're putting together these tools, these guidelines, but we're not, we're not codified yet. And that's what we're, we're working towards with all of these activities. And just to kind of give a, a big overview of where all of that is headed, um, all of this began even 18. Um, uh, NEHRP was reauthorized um, and it included specific lang language that changed the overall NEHRP director, uh, program direction to enhance the aspect of earthquake resilience, meaning that building structures would allow for continued use and reoccupancy following an earthquake. Next year, NIST and FEMA, as part of that reauthorization, NIST and FEMA were ordered, if you will, 
to convene a committee of experts to assess and recommend options for improving the built environment and critical infrastructure to reflect performance goals stated in terms of post earthquake reoccupancy and functional recovery time. This is very exciting. Lots of words here, but it's very, very exciting to, to actually have codified that earthquake resilience means that buildings would be uh, to allow for the continued use and reoccupancy and we have functional recovery timeline. We just these concepts are now being introduced at a, a national codified uh, level in, in the congressional um, uh, docket, if you would, if that's the right word. Um, and to start moving that towards reality, uh, the next year, last year, uh, the special pub that publication actually was issued, and I would urge you to to look at that. It just offers a guideline and recommendations for state and local jurisdictions to improve the earthquake preparedness and recovery time of their communities, including modifications to building codes to incorporate functional recovery standards. And I think that's a really important aspect. Whoops, important aspect that. Um, Oh, sorry, I keep clicking. Um, so AB 1329, if you're aware of that, um, California was trying to do this. Um, blueprint down there, but um, they were trying to do this. They were trying to move the needle. Um, and over several years, we've been trying to do this and we've always failed um, for, for different reasons. And this year we really had, had it set. We're uh, doing a hot wash on this. Um, I'm sorry, what AB 1329 was gonna do was require the um, uh, building, building commission to, um, to develop, implement and adopt a building code um, around, uh, I'm sorry, so here it is result in a post-event performance state in which a building's structural and non-structural capacity are maintained or can be restored to support the intended functions associated with the building's pre-event use and occupancy within an acceptable time frame. It was, it was actually, it was actually going to become a building code in California around this. It's very, very exciting. Um, it failed. It failed at the last minute. It failed for reasons we're not even clear of yet. I think the positive is that we the positive is that we don't know. It wasn't budget. It wasn't policy. We had the support. Um, we're, frankly, this happened just a few weeks ago. Um, we are still trying to gather information on why that all happened. Um, my little thing, maybe I can die. Maybe I, my, I can retire now. Um, I highlighted the one thing I did change in this is to not go from earthquake. I moved it from um, all this language uh, in the, at the federal level about earthquakes. I wanted California. I wanted this legislation to clear the way for wildfire, for um, sea, water, sea, sea level rise. I wanted to clear the way that this is not, this, these concepts are not earthquake specific. They are not. They need to be moved. So it, it, this, we're in this odd space that Everybody is talking about climate change. Everything is policy is driven by climate change. We have all this money in HMGP and FEMA's BRIC program to, to move the needle because of climate change. But the earthquake world was offered this sort of um, fast pass, if you will, to, to um, reshape the idea of what a building code should be. And we were given that through the NEHRP reauthorization. We tried, man, we tried with Kelt with AB 1329. We almost got there. I think we can absolutely do that in the near future. Um, but it shouldn't be earthquake specific. And um, that publication that I that's written there, and we can I can send it out if uh, anybody would like. It offers um, suggestions to do reach codes that that local jurisdictions can actually adopt based on where they are now. That can they just do this one thing for critical facilities? Can they? We um, require for new buildings um, a building code uh, event, you know, that, that states that um, hospitals, firehouses, police stations need to be up and fully operational within three days. Can we say that? Can we do a reach code just for a small city? And that's what um, that's I think what we're going to have to do. I think that's the way forward in this. And um, Cross my fingers, as goes California, so goes the rest of the world. We're gonna keep trying on the California front. We're gonna keep trying on the federal front, but there's not, the disappointing part in being on FEMA's NAC is that um, FEMA itself can't do anything. It can't make people adopt building codes. It can incentivize, but um, it can incentivize the adoption of building codes, but it can't do a lot more than that. Um, okay, I'll wrap up here. Um, so. A big vision back to Puerto Rico, like, okay, so big picture, take a step back from all that conversation about resilient stuff. 
can, you know, what can we do about existing buildings in Puerto Rico? What can we do about new buildings of Puerto Rico? Can we adopt some of these technology, this leapfrogging? Um, with regards to existing buildings, we have record brick and HMGP funds available. Um, we can, you know, do some targeted outreach of mitigation through some of using some of those technology tools. We can identify neighborhoods, we can identify buildings, we can identify critical facilities. We can target and begin there. We can begin at, the, at a small level and hope that that might grow, that it might, might cause some um, and adoption from, from those maybe use cases that are framed like that perhaps. Um, there's different insurance options, possibly, I hope. Uh, we talked a lot about that a lot on FEMA's NAC. All hazards insurance, renter's insurance. Um, there are a lot of attempts to try to penetrate um, into the renter's market into um, it, it, and offer new solutions. Um, Lemonade is one that, that pops up. Just make it easy for people to get insurance, make it cheap. Um, and I, I don't feel satisfied we have a solution there yet, but I, I'm hopeful and keeping an eye on that. New buildings, of course, Puerto Rico adopted the 2018 ICC codes. Um, there was $79 million for code enforcement. Code enforcement, just for Puerto Rico. I think that's awesome. I saw last, and correct me if I'm wrong, that like 100 new building inspectors were hired, or maybe they were hoping to hire. Um, uh, their solar rooftop policy, um, and I mentioned it twice, more innovative insurance options for new buildings. Um, and of course, on the technology leapfrogging side, um, don't mean to beat a dead horse here, but um, we these, these technologies are coming online. They'll be cost effective, scalable to capture real world conditions. Um, we can capture, back to the hazard aspect, we can capture historic flooding. We can capture new, you know, existing flooding from now on in, in a great scientific, you know, high quality way. Um, uh, this, of course, sat based internet uh, is coming online. I actually signed up myself because our internet is terrible. I hope it hasn't affected this presentation. Um, but I think just can we can we start to bring all this together? Can we build toward um, real change? Like I said, that affects people on the ground that they can they can you know actually raise their hand and point at something on their building that that improves resilience, improves the resilience of that family and of of the neighborhood and of the community. Um, the data has to be relevant and accessible to those who actually need it, who, those who actually can use it. Um, let the community will and needs drive the priorities. Um, sometimes it's, you know, doing a soft story retrofit program in the middle of um, Montana may not be the best way to do it, but maybe we can get that program up and running and wait for the next earth week to happen. Um, the, the community has to be behind, behind things, and I'm preaching to the choir here about that. Um, seeking dual purpose opportunities, multi-hazard and multi-initiative. Um, if the initiative goes back to some of the sustainability and green and um, environmental justice, um, equitable and social justice issues, can we, can, we, can we put some resilience in there too? Because like I said, we need to build the communities um, that are, that, that the community, I'm sorry, we need to build what the communities need for the future generations. And it's gonna be all of those things, not just resilience, not just um, not just any of those things alone. Um, and of course the policy question, do you force it or do you incentivize it? Um, and I don't know, I pretend to be a policy wonk and I'm not very good at it. So with that said, um, I'd love to hear, hear some thoughts, get some feedback. Um, where did I go wrong? Where did any of this go right? What is actually possible to implement in Puerto Rico? Um, 